Oh. Right, I'm going to start this talk with questions because I'm unconventional like that. So, first question. How many people have either heard of homebrew or have any idea what it is? And it's not about beer. Okay? <laughs> How many people in here are running a Mac as their kind of maidish computer? Okay, about the same number of people. Okay, so if you get if anyone gets really bored or really confused with anything I'm saying, just shout and I'll try and go faster or slower or whatever. How many people are using it? it? <laughs> what was that? How many people are using it? Oh in here. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm confused. What's going on? You didn't ask how many people are using it. I think that's the most important. Oh, uh, it's okay. I, I'm not being like that. Uh, <laughs> I'll I'll be that site, it's just like me. <laughs> right, so <laughs> that's where you contact me. Homebrew. Why? So there was a man called Max. This man called Max used a thing called Mac Ports and got very angry with this thing called Mac Ports because it does things like this. So if you want to install Git on Macports, Git being a popular version control system, then what Macports has to do is install all these things first. So what I will come to in a minute is actually that is somewhat unnecessary because if you install Git and Homebrew, to jump ahead for a moment, then you have to install this. Oh wait, I have forgotten to fill out the slide. Or have I? <laughs> <laughs> to explain something which you probably don't care about, but people like me do care a lot about, basically, all this shit already comes with your computer. Well, almost all of it. So if you have a Mac. So that's the difference between like Macs and package managers on Macs compared to Linux or Windows or whatever. And then you have a whole lot of crap, particularly like open source libraries and things like that that are provided with your Mac. Now, Mac ports decides that actually they don't like the way Apple do things, so they're gonna go build all this stuff like they're themselves so they can kind of control the versions. But the disadvantage of doing it that way compared to this way is that when you install Git with Mac ports, it takes a hell of a lot longer to install, and generally it uses all this crap that you probably don't care about, you probably don't want, whatever. So, Max went and decided, I'm gonna make my own version. And everyone said, aha, you're an idiot, no one will use your version, and you'll have to do all the Mac ports with it eventually. And seemingly, they were wrong. But anyway, so I ended up meeting Max, um, and a few other people did as well, and Homebrew kind of began. So Homebrew, it's GitHub based and uses kind of Git and GitHub as the kind of storage method and kind of back end way of transferring data around and all that fun stuff. Um, and I kind of stumbled upon it because I was having similar problems with Macports and got involved. So nowadays, uh, Homebrew has lots of users, lots of hopefully mostly happy users, and like all the actual kind of work in the repository is done by these seven people. Um, so Max, who's the repository in Anderson, in is, no, no, is in his name, and then there's kind of the rest of us sorted in roughly kind of commit order. Um, and basically what happens is with Homebrew, unlike most other package managers, where if say there is an update to some package, say there's an update to Git tomorrow. So the way it works in most package managers is you have like a guy who's a maintainer and he notices and says, aha, there has been an update to Git. I will go and then update Git, blah, 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 blah. But that relies, obviously, on him having free time to do that, him noticing, him setting it up, whatever. And there's this very much kind of this two-tier structure of the people who are kind of actually doing the stuff and then the people who use it. Whereas with Homebrew, we have these people who actually are the only people who have commit access to the GitHub repository. But then we have a few more people who have actually made commits. And I've got their names on the next slide. So <laughs> I hope you can read that in text the small the back. Uh, so we've had 2,908 contributors to Homebrew as of today. So basically, the way it works with Homebrew is most people will go, which is one of the reasons why we're the most, one of the top three kind of forked repositories on GitHub. So people will fork the Homebrew repository, they will add their own new package or an update to an existing package, and then they can just send us a pull request. I'll talk a bit more about the process of that later on. But basically it means that rather than us kind of seven people having to do a whole lot of work that you normally get done with a package manager. Instead, we are kind of almost more kind of wrangling and managing other people's contributions, which is probably 95% of the work that kind of actually goes into Homebrew. So, in case you think, ah, oh, this Homebrew stuff sounds great, how do I get me some of that? Uh, very briefly, how to install it. So you need an Intel CPU, you need a Mac, which is running 10.5 or later, and then you need to install Xcode or this weird thing called command line tools for Xcode, which basically is just Apple letting you have the compiler and stuff. 
Um, uh, but that will automatically store with your Azure Mavericks, so then things will be a bit happier. Do you have to do that with MacBooks? Uh, yes, <laughs> you do. You have to yeah. install the problem with MacBooks as well. Um, I, but if you want to install it, we were one of the first cool people to do this uh, thing which makes security people very upset, where you just say, <laughs> let's just install stuff by piping a random script into our terminal and doing what it says. <laughs> we do prompt you and tell you what we're going to do and stuff like that. But anyway, so that little one-liner will go and run the homebrew installation script and install on your system. So once you have homebrew installed, you might want to install something that doesn't come on Macs, so it comes on Linux, like wget. So if you type brew install wget, then you will see something a bit like this. So it will download, it will run configure, make install, which if you're a kind of somewhat Unixy, open sourcey, Linuxy person, that should seem all terribly familiar. And then at the end you have a bunch of stuff and the amount of time it takes to build it. And because we're really cool like that, because on OS X it supports emoticons in the terminal now, <laughs> we now have a little emoticon for beer. And you would not believe how many people who otherwise seem to lead content normal lives got very upset about that. <laughs> um, so, what happens when you actually install it? So what we do, again, slightly different than other package managers, is we have a seller and we separate each package into its own prefix and then we symlink everything into one place. I'll kind of walk you through that in a minute. But basically, so when I install wget, rather than it strewing like shit all over your computer, Everything that WGET actually has installed is under this one directory. So I go to user local, which is the default Humber installation. Uh, if you don't like that, then leave. Uh, <laughs> and then under the seller, then I basically, I'm just saying list all the files under here, and then that's the stuff that's installed. Basically, all of this is provided by WGET itself, and then the only thing which is actually homebrew files is this install receipt, which is basically just some kind of basic JSON metadata. Again, different to other package managers, perhaps, we don't tend to kind of have like a big package database and all these kind of binary archiving formats. Everything's in plain test from disk, either in JSON or in Ruby files. So if I want to install Qt, this is where we get a bit of self-promotion, uh, because I got fed up of having things like that. You know, that is 46 seconds of my life I'm never going to get back. <laughs> and the problem is, well, sorry, the, the good thing is about Macs is that unlike Linux where you can have all sorts of different distributions and different versions and stuff like that, if I have a Mac, and it's running the same operating system 10.8 or whatever, then if you have a Mac that's running 10.8 as well, then literally all the libraries you have in your system that we kind of rely on will be exactly the same. And equally, if I compile something in my system, I can just copy that onto your machine, and that works fine. So basically, I created a kind of binary packaging format, which are called bottles, obviously, keeping in the theme. So if you install Qt, then this is a bottle instead. So it downloads the bottle from SourceForge until it shuts down for using too much bandwidth. Uh, and then it just pours the bottle instead, which is a hell of a lot quicker, just downloading and extracting a toggle than it is to go and do the same thing with building it all yourself. Typically something like Qt, which takes kind of half an hour, an hour to kind of build. Um, so then, much the same result. So what I was saying with the symlink stuff before, uh, basically what we have is user local, which is our main kind of prefix, which we kind of install everything into. And then in the bin directory, if we, we look in here and we say, let's look at the symlinks. So we have bin wget is not actually an executable, but it points instead into the seller. So basically what we have is you only need to add user local bin to your path, and then you can just go and run, and it will go and automatically symlink everything into the right prefixes and yada yada yada. So the kind of cool thing about that is if you want to uninstall software, you can just remove the prefix. You don't need to worry about, sorry, you can remove the, the, place, the prefix it has in the seller. And you don't need to worry about it kind of, as I said before, chucking shit all over your system. So to use Homebrew, some kind of brief overview of stuff. So you might run Brew Outdated. That basically says, what do I have that needs upgraded on my machine? Then surprisingly, you might type Brew Upgrade to upgrade it, uh, and then if you want to upgrade a specific formula, like wget we saw before, then just brew upgrade wget. Um, some other stuff. So we cache all your stuff in to get that directory, the brew dash dash cache. You can list the contents doing that. And to view the man page, which is unfortunately very infrequently updated and not in any way up to date with what the code actually does. No. It, the man page works all right for anything you will need to do. It's frustrating for people like me. We kind of use all the kind of mixing parties because no one else talking about you. 
<laughs> it's only to find a technical writer. Exactly. Technical writer who would work for free. <laughs> um, but yes, so, as well as having lots of nice pull requests from people, unfortunately, sometimes people have issues. And I'm not just talking about general issues people have in life. We call them issues because that's what GitHub calls them, and we use GitHub for our, our bug tracking. So, if you have an issue with Homebrew, here are the things you should do before you bother me. You should do these. Did you update? Did you run Brew Doctor? Again, although we kind of suck at documentation, something we are quite good at is we have lots of cool little automated tools like Brew Doctor. So basically, pretty much whenever we see the same bug occurring again and again because someone uses some stupid thing on their computer, we go and add a check for that in Brew Doctor. And if you run Brew Doctor, then it will list a bunch of stuff that we kind of think is suspicious or wrong or whatever with your computer. That does not mean your computer is having any problems, but it means when you have problems, <coughs> then we can kind of point out to you what they might be and try and suggest some sort of fixes. Are you running the latest version of Xcode? Have you completely ruined MacBots and Think? That's not just because we hate them, it's because they tend to interfere with each other and they pick up each other's stuff and then it's all a big disaster. Uh, and do you need to own user local by your own user? Again, that's something we do. It's a little bit controversial. Again, security people sometimes get upset. But the reasoning is on Macs, the applications directory is user writable as well. So basically, if you can chuck applications in your application directory, why not be able to use without changing to root and chuck applications in your user local? So, uh, again, how to debug stuff. Go and send our stuff, run brew install v, which is verbose for the thing you're trying to install, and then GIST the output. If you haven't used GIST, it's basically like a paste bin service provided by GitHub. And do the same thing with Brew Doctor. And all of this is on a troubleshooting page, which at the top of it, we have this. <laughs> troubleshooting. Please, 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 Brew Doctor before creating a ticket. If you create a ticket, please paste your Brew Doctor. Now, you would be surprised how many people do not paste their Brew Doctor output, and you'd be surprised how many people paste output, which includes this at the bottom of it, and then say, but I did everything you said. Oh, you're such entitled jerks. <laughs> That's more my issues. Than uh, so on to some slightly cooler stuff. Again, another thing that Homebrew does, which is one of the reasons I think it's got a bit more popular, is it's really easy to create new packages. So say we were living in a parallel universe where we didn't have uh, wget in our repository. So you would say, I want me a bit of wget. So, if you find the URL for where the wget toggle is on the internet, then you can type brew create and then point it to the toggle, and then it will download it and then create a file for you. And then it says, please run brew audit, which is another one of our tools for kind of formula creation, which is what we call our kind of package description. So, this is probably going to be too small for anyone to read, but what we then generate in the right place and stuff is this file here. And I'll just talk through very briefly what's going on here. But basically, so this is our kind of formula description file. It's actually just a class in Ruby, the subclasses from formula, and it's in a .rb file in the library formula directory. And basically, we have gone and nicely pre-populated a lot of the stuff for you. Pre-populated the name, the URL, the SHA-1. We don't have a version in that because we sniff it from the URL. And then, you know, kind of some sensible stuff in here. You have configure and make install and a test, which hopefully you can put in. So if I was to fix that up, then it would look something like this afterwards. And you can see in here, basically, the stuff in orange Although that should be on as well, I'd like to change that today. That's the only stuff that you've actually had to enter manually yourself. So basically, for something like WGET, the only thing you actually need to enter is the home page and the test. So, as you can see, it's pretty easy to make new packages compared to if anyone here has ever tried to make new kind of Debian packages or RPMs. Again, they do things in a certain way, and that's okay, and they're a lot more perhaps robust or thorough than we are, but it, it's a complete nightmare compared to stuff like this. But anyway, then you can run brew audit wget, which basically goes and looks at this and makes sure you haven't made any silly mistakes or kind of bad practices or whatever. And then after that, you go and try and build this on your machine. And then if you pass this build bottle, then that basically means that you can kind of distribute that binary. Remember the bottling stuff I was talking about earlier. Run brew bottle, then you kind of generated a binary. You can then stick that into your formula file as well. We obviously like relatively sensible people don't accept random binaries from people because we don't want them. random binaries from random people to be installed on all our users' machines. But if you're doing this yourself, or you can kind of quite happily go and have your own formula which you don't share with other people, then this type of stuff can become quite useful. But yeah, so you, you've added your beautiful new package, you want to contribute that to Homebrew. 
So, first thing, if you don't already have it, you need to install Git, you need to then update, and then you need to go on GitHub to our repository, which is github.com slash mxcl slash homebrew, and then you need to fork it using this button here, or I should have described that in text because their interface will change and therefore my presentation will be better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so then you get your own fork for those who aren't familiar with, is everyone more or less familiar with GitHub forking parlance and stuff? Stick your hand up if you're not. Okay, cool. Uh, so very briefly, basically that's just a complete copy of someone else's repository, which you can make all your own modifications to, and then it means you can kind of submit them back later on. Uh, basically, so I have my own copy of the repository. This might seem slightly odd, considering I have right access to the repository, but it's kind of useful sometimes for code review. And obviously, if I want to kind of make random changes to homebrew, I probably want to test them myself before <coughs> I push them to everyone. So here I've got a fork. I've made my own branch here called git-etc. And then what I'm going to do is make this pull request, which is what this is in here. Um, oh, sorry, by clicking that button there, which again, you know, you have to change next week. Uh, so I then create this pull request, pops up a new that looks like this. Again, it looks something different last week, it looks different the week after. Um, but yeah, so basically, it kind of has the vague contents of the commit, what I want people to look at and stuff like that. And then that's the kind of commit to the bottom. And then what this will do is get sent to the inboxes of everyone who has commit access on Homebrew and other random people who follow the project. And we will see something like this, which is a nice, beautiful pull request. This is how we do most of our kind of submissions, most of our kind of code review between the team. And basically let's just kind of go through view the code and the kind of files change and then we can review this. So this is actually an outstanding pull request of mine, which um, again, as you may have noticed, because there are only seven of us and probably only kind of four to five of us like actively working on homebrew, it sometimes takes us a while to get through the pull requests. So far we've had, I think in the four years homebrew's been around, we've had something like twenty-five thousand pull requests. Um, so we do take a while. I made this five months ago. Five months ago, Jack said, sorry, keep me to look at it, we'll review soon. <laughs> Not reviewed yet. <laughs> but anyway, so if you are contributing to the homebrew, save you a bit of time. Stuff we don't accept, we don't like self-updating tools like NPM. It's not that we don't like them, it's just it doesn't play very nicely to install that with homebrew and then it kind of updates itself and homebrew doesn't think it's the same version as it is and all this type of stuff. And niche stuff as well. Again, you would think this would be common sense, but if you wrote a project over the weekend and it's a 0 0.0000001 release and no one has ever used it and everyone you've ever shown it to thinks it's rubbish, don't submit it to Homebrew immediately because chances are, politely, we don't care and other people don't care yet. We may care and other people may care later, but we don't yet. So save yourself some time and hold off for a little bit. But anyway, so all this stuff, all this effort, as you've seen before, there was kind of seven of us, uh, it's kind of tricky to get all this stuff done, particularly with like binary packages. So with binary packages before, anything you install Homebrew, which is kind of using a binary package using a bottle, was previously done by me going and having multiple VMs of each version of OS X on my machine, and I would go and have to go and manually build the package on each VM and then upload it. So this became a little bit <coughs> unsustainable, um, particularly when I was on holiday and things like that. So we decided we would do a Kickstarter. Um, and basically what we told people with the Kickstarter is I wrote a little tool while I was away and kind of had some time off work last year in beautiful Sydney and wrote basically a little tool for kind of beginnings of a sort of CI system called Brew Test for. Again, another little automated thing. Basically just trying to turn our review process into code. So what this does is I'm getting it to test a particular pull request. It will then download the pull request, make sure there's no, nothing wrong with the system, make sure there's nothing wrong with it the changes in the pull request, which in this case was this package mom, was see anything that changed. Download it, install it, bottle it, make sure that's okay, uninstall it, and then return the state. So I wrote this little tool, and we basically went and asked some people for some money. So we asked people for 1,500 pounds, um, so we could buy a Mac Mini. And thankfully, we got quite a bit more than that. We got 14,000 pounds. In fact, we got our 1,500 pounds two hours after the Kickstarter began. Um, from 755 very nice people. Again, if you're interested in such things, the graph of money <laughs> looks look like this. So that was, uh, the green line is our 1,500. <laughs> and I believe 
So that was basically just everyone going mad, and then somewhere around here was when John Gruber, if anyone reads Daring Fireball, uh, retweeted us, and a bunch of other people. Um, and we were also lucky enough to be featured on the Kickstarter homepage for a couple of days and all that type of thing. So yeah, so we got lots of money, and it's great. Um, if you're vaguely interested, if you're the type of person who's ever doing a Kickstarter. So our breakdown looked like this. We got lots and lots of people off of Twitter. 22% uh, of people clicked directly through from Twitter and gave our money that way. Um, obviously, that excludes people where there's no referral information, which is about quarter. We put it on our <coughs> GitHub page. We got a bunch of referrals from that. Some people found us through search. And then, obviously, we got 500 quid, which is pretty nice from being on, well, sorry, 600 quid from being on the homepage, and 500 quid from being like a feature project in the kind of open software section. So instead of one Mac Mini, we got four Mac Minis. <laughs> Hooray! Uh, so well, I basically, we were able to get all these. It was pretty awesome. We had to set up like a organization in the UK, so Homebrew actually kind of exists, because I didn't want HMRC to say, aha, you have appeared to have 15,000 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> and because we initially didn't have a server farm, my office had a thing that looked a bit like this, and my wife was continuing asking, when are these computers going to go away? <laughs> They're staying here forever, and I just made sure I kept the electricity bills on. Uh, but we had nice, very nicely uh, a company called Positive Internet, who I kind of randomly interacted with the CEO uh, on from a kind of podcast stuff he was doing. Uh, they offered to host us in their data center called Positive Park, which is down near Cambridge. So I got on the train with all the computers, which is quite a scary thing to take like. £8,000 worth of computers on a train. <laughs> uh, and then we got all our nice stuff, a little switch, and time capsule to back everything up. And then we stored all the nice stuff. And, uh, and then here you go. And there's cables everywhere, so it's probably going on fire. But, uh, yeah, so it's pretty awesome. And now what we have is we have a Jenkins instance, which goes and runs pretty much all the time. It basically so we have kind of several things it's doing. So basically everything, every change that's made for Homebrew, it goes and runs to make sure that it kind of passes all our little tests and then emails it. If it doesn't, it checks all pull requests and GitHub has some neat pull request integration now so you can actually basically mark in big red letters as pull request succeeded or failed or whatever. So that's kind of nice. And we found since doing that, that kind of automated process, a lot of users will go and kind of start fixing the issues themselves without us having to go and tell them, which is great because, as I said, probably 95% of our workload before was telling people exactly what the output of these tools are. We would just download them onto our local machines, the tool would say, this is bad, and then we would type in, this is bad, and then, you know. So this has made things much better, and then it's also mean that it's much, much easier for us to build binary packages now. I just basically kick off the job, and then in a couple of minutes, it's built the binary packages for all the operating systems. Uh, so across those kind of multiple Mac minis, we basically have it running. We have one that's just doing server -y stuff, and then the kind of current and past two generations of OSX. Um, so that basically lets us build all our binaries and test stuff pretty thoroughly between them as well, which is quite nice. And we have a mailing list. If you're particularly, uh, I don't know, bored or something, then you could subscribe to the mailing list of only build failures in Homebrew. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fun reading on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, so yeah, so, if anyone is kind of involved with like an open source project or whatever, and you kind of feel, oh man, if only we had some hardware or whatever, I would really consider, I would really advise you, sorry, to consider something like Kickstarter because it seems to have this weird traction in that people, because it's time limited, or basically the way it works, if anyone's not familiar, is you need to say an amount of money you want and you get a month or however long you choose to raise that amount of money. If you raise that amount of money or more, you get to keep it. If you don't get to raise that amount of money, you don't get to keep anything. So it seems to kind of get people engaged, and lots of people are kind of more willing, similarly, to hand over stuff in exchange, you know, ridiculous stuff like you know, 250 quid, and you get a t shirt and a pint glass, and people are more than happy to kind of hand over that money. Although it does mean that you need to get t shirts printed and stuff, which is significantly harder than any part of writing the code. <laughs> um, but yeah, so. I guess that's basically the overview of Hungary. So if anyone has any questions, um, feel free. Um, it was just on that, that uh, Kickstarter bit. Yeah. Uh, did you have to pay any tax in the end for when creating that corporation? Uh, so it's created as basically a non-profit, just like committee, sorry, community organization. So 
you don't need to pay any tax because it's in no way related to me. It's just this kind of floating organization. But Kickstarter takes, uh, between Kickstarter and Amazon Marketplace, they take about 10% of the money raised. But then again, it's such a good kind of crowdfunding tool that you don't really mind that. You said several slides ago yep. about the uh, one of the things you ask people is that it's not working. Uh, have you got the latest version of Xcode working? Yeah. So I've got lots of old Macs, and the answer to that is no, because I can't put them on there because they're so old, but they still work. Yeah. Is there any way to get this stuff to work without using Xcode as the development? Component? So we basically, in that case, I, I was being overly concise. So it's basically the latest yeah. version of Xcode for whatever operating system you are on. Okay, cool. So for the older versions that don't get kept, kept up to date with Xcode, then it's kind of fine. Uh, the short answer is yes, but only for kind of new versions. So we've been kind of petitioning Apple to try and get, because obviously people don't want to install like a, what was at one stage, like an eight gig package, just to have a compiler on their machine. Um, we had got some incremental progress with the kind of command line tool stuff, which was like a separate couple of hundred meg installer. Um, and then in the latest version, we've kind of been talking with a few guys there, and it's kind of more or less perfect in that. Um, if any of you have kind of used the like latest versions of OS X, you'll see if you try and do something with X11 or Java, then it, they're not installed by default. And if you try and do something with Java, it'll just pop a little box saying, if you're trying to use Java, would you like to install Java? Um, so it's now starting to do that with the compilers um, as of 10.9, which obviously hasn't been released yet, but it's in betas. So our lives will become a bit easier then, but we're still going to have to support the other versions for ages. So uh, sadly, in terms of distributing our own compilers and stuff like that, it's not actually that easy because on Macs particularly, there's a lot of, so there's a lot of stuff that's open source, probably 75% of it, but then a bunch of it is like Apple's private headers and all this type of stuff, which we can't do this year. I mean, someone could and other people do, but we don't want the legal pain. How do you manage versions? Uh, we don't, basically. Uh, we, well, basically what we do is, in Homebrew, we have like only the latest version of each thing, effectively. And then we have two sort of alternate strategies that are kind of hacks around the fact that we don't really manage versions. One is you can always just go through the Git history and we have a command that does that and just pull out an old version and install that, um, it that way. And Would that be in parallel? Or... Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the versions quite happily exist. I guess that's the difference compared to other things. Because of our kind of seller system, um, you can have as many packages as you want with as many versions as you want all in parallel. And even if they kind of conflict in terms of naming and all this type of stuff, then they're just kind of nicely segmented away. The other kind of slight hack we have is we have like a homebrew versions, like other repository, which contains, you know, like MySQL with a version number appended to the name. And then, you know, that's just a kind of static version that kind of stays along. Well, that's great. Thank you very much, everyone.